The monotonous hum of machines filled the vast space of the workshop. However, the women paid no attention to this accompanying sound because they were working against the clock. The factory workers had long understood that their financial well-being depended on meeting production deadlines, so they diligently stitched miles of seams, sometimes forgetting that the stitches had to be perfectly even. Olivia's responsibilities included strict quality control of the finished products. She had to not only inspect all the seams but also assess each finished item based on several parameters. There were days when the tension made her eyes dart around nervously, but she was ready to endure any inconvenience because this job allowed her and her son to survive in the challenging conditions of modern life. Olivia barely had time to catch her breath when the conveyor belt sent another item to the inspection stand. Her trained eye as a professional immediately detected defects, and the rejected jacket found its place in a half-filled container, appropriately marked. Amidst the noise of the machinery, the forewoman's voice was heard. Olivia, you're rejecting perfectly decent products. By doing this, you're condemning the whole batch. Lisa, what do you expect from me? Tell your girls not to sew defective items, and the problems will resolve themselves. The forewoman reached into the box and pulled out the jacket Olivia had just rejected. She scrutinized it critically for a minute, then tossed it back. Olivia felt Lisa's change in mood as a growing tension in the air. The forewoman said, Olivia, do you understand the consequences of such extensive rejection? By the way, your earnings also depend on completing this order. Lisa, you don't need to remind me of that. The forewoman gently turned the slender inspector to face her. Olivia, everyone makes mistakes, and you might accidentally overlook a small defect too. You can't be so rigid. After all, you're not the only one in the team. Olivia understood the forewoman's hint. If I understand you correctly, you're suggesting I let some of the defective items pass. The forewoman nodded eagerly. Another jacket floated down the conveyor, and a crooked stitch snaked its way down the front. Lisa, are you also suggesting I turn a blind eye to this? You understand perfectly well that rejecting the entire batch could have consequences for both you and me. The jacket with the crooked zipper flew onto the conveyor. Lisa swore and collected the rejected items in a bundle. She took a few steps and almost shouted, Hey, clumsy hands, confess, who messed up? Silent. No worries, I'll quickly figure it out. The forewoman's voice drowned in the roar of sewing machines, and Olivia thought, Someone among the girls is about to face the consequences. Lisa doesn't like it when she's in her mind. The inspector didn't even have time to finish this thought when an outraged voice from the far end of the hall was heard again. Amber, is this your work? What are you doing? Answer properly. You promised me you'd quit this. I compromised for you, and what did I get in return? No, Amber, this can't go on. First, you're going to redo all the defective items, and then you'll write a resignation letter of your own accord, or you'll face disciplinary action. Such incidents were not uncommon, and the women had become accustomed to them. Most of the seamstresses continued to work without raising their eyes, and only a few could afford to take a moment's distraction. This diligence was due to the technical peculiarities of the sewing process, where each step was calculated almost by the second. In such a demanding rhythm of work, enduring 12-hour shifts was too much for many. High turnover rates were also exacerbated by the company's management, which imposed harsh penalties for the slightest mistake. Olivia raised this issue at staff meetings multiple times. We can't treat people like serfs and demand the impossible from them. After all, a human isn't a machine. They can't work almost half a day without a break. It seems to me that it's high time to change our approach to organizing work, Olivia roughly stated in her speech at the last meeting in the presence of the company director. Hugh clearly did not like this speech. Listen, Olivia, it's not for me to explain to you that the rules here are set by the owner. Your job is to do what the owner orders. Don't like this order? Well, the door is always open. 
The young woman retorted angrily. That's why no one stays at your company for long. Professionals leave more often. By the way, at the time we're so dismissive of now. People worked here for decades. So, for the management, the main value was the employees, not just money. And how do you know all this? Olivia replied calmly. My aunt worked at this company. She worked here for a very long time. Olivia stormed out of the conference room, quickly striding down the corridor. Within a few minutes, she regretted her frankness. Her excessive boldness could lead to her dismissal. The rest of the workday was full of anxiety, but it passed without consequences. Another jacket came down the conveyor belt, and the inspector found no flaws in the garment. However, with her experienced eye, she determined that this item was from the batch she had rejected. As the shift neared its end, the inspector was satisfied to see that the reject container was empty. She was about to start preparing her report on the finished products when the secretary entered the workshop. Olivia, the boss wants to see you immediately, just to be sure. The woman timidly knocked and heard a friendly voice. Olivia, come in. The director appeared to be in a good mood, as evidenced by the warm smile on his face. Olivia, have a seat. We need to talk about something. The director paused meaningfully. Your speech at the last meeting did not go unnoticed. We have taken all your comments into account and will try to address the shortcomings as soon as possible. Now, let's return to our production matters. The company owner has been informed, but he is currently away. However, Robert has instructed us to review our approach to work organization and implement an additional system to motivate employees. Am I making myself clear? Yes, you were right about many things, raising the issue of the work day, unfair fines, and other nuances that we encounter daily in our work. You're correct that people should come first. By the way, Robert also noticed this, and he has instructed us to reward the best employees of the company. So, I'm assigning you the task of compiling a list. You, why me? I would really like you to get involved in charity work a bit. Funds have already been allocated for this purpose, and our partners have promised to contribute a little more. The director tore a sheet from his notepad and hurriedly wrote down a phone number and address. Here, Olivia, here are the coordinates of the office where you will receive the check. Don't worry, we have everything arranged at the highest level. The head of the company, Jesse Lane, is a long-time partner of ours, so there should be no complications. And when should I go there? The boss glanced at his watch and then at the woman. Why are you so frightened? Your expression has changed. I need to pick up my son from daycare. They don't like it when parents are late. I didn't say you have to go there today. You'll go there tomorrow morning. Contact the management department. There's a nice girl there who's aware of our business. Following her boss's instructions, Olivia sent Cal to daycare earlier the next day and hurried to the address the director had given her the previous day. She easily found the company's office and went to the second floor, where the relevant department was located. But when she opened the door, Olivia was stunned. Sitting behind the desk was Jennifer, her archenemy. The visitor couldn't help but exclaim, You! Jennifer was equally surprised. Olivia! What a surprise. I can't say it's a pleasure to see you, but it's interesting to know what brings you here. Olivia wanted to leave the room as quickly as possible because it was unpleasant for her to see her old acquaintance, who had made her life miserable. Negative energy radiated from Jennifer, and it could be felt from a distance. Olivia briefly explained the purpose of her visit, while giving Jennifer an assessing look. I've been sent by my boss. I work for Robert. In turn, the office's owner cast a scornful glance at the visitor. You're here for the check, right? I'm aware. I'll give it to you right now. You'll just need to sign for receiving it. Jennifer handed over an open ledger, and Olivia quickly signed in the designated space. Jennifer handed her the check. Here you go, Olivia. Although we didn't part on the best terms, I'm still curious to know how you're doing. Olivia took the check. Fine, like everyone else. 
Not worse, not better. Jennifer gracefully arched her back, and her tight blouse accentuated her ample bust. Olivia remembered that she used to employ this trick frequently in her youth to attract guys. It must be said that this move never failed to work. Olivia decisively turned away, signaling the end of the conversation. However, Jennifer stopped her. Olivia, don't rush off. We have things to discuss. Olivia stopped in her tracks. We've said everything to each other a long time ago. I hope this is our last encounter. Olivia, it's actually quite cool to realize that the world is so small. Nearly a decade ago, we went our separate ways. And now, here we are, meeting again. By the way, I'm getting married very soon. Olivia stared at Jennifer. Wait, are you? No, my dear. I didn't marry Peter. Yes, we dated for a while, and then I realized he wasn't the right fit for me. Thankfully, I came to my senses just in time, and I realized I needed a different man. So, in other words, you used Peter and discarded him like an unwanted item. Jennifer Smart. Yes, that's like. And how did you find your extraordinary man? Of a, I'm changing my last name to Link very soon, and my status is changing too. It took Olivia only a few seconds to realize where she had heard that last name before. She mechanically glanced at the check. Link, the owner of the company. You're marrying him. Joy radiated from Jennifer. Yes. You can't even imagine the efforts it took to win this man over. A few years ago, there was a family tragedy due to a medical mistake, and he lost his wife. In short, there's a whole tragedy there. Too much to explain in a minute. Maybe we should meet up, have a chat. Olivia replied somewhat vaguely. I don't know. Jennifer, I have absolutely no free time. Work and now added public responsibilities. Oh, right. I've been assigned by the boss to visit a couple of children's institutions on behalf of the company and distribute gifts there. What about your schedule? I don't know. My boss hasn't given me any instructions yet. Well, Jennifer, I have to go. I need to get to work. Jennifer once again twisted her face in a disgusted grimace, but Olivia didn't notice this. She hurried to the workshop where her presence was truly needed. The chance encounter with her former rival had stung her a bit, but she diligently pushed away the unpleasant memories. She didn't want to dredge up the past, but her memory persistently brought her back to those years. Olivia's life hadn't been easy from the very beginning, but it had presented her with many trials. She had no recollection of her father and only knew about him from her aunt's stories. Her mother, Sarah, had never mentioned her husband. Most often, Sarah would complain about her fate in the presence of her own sister, Carolina, who regularly visited them. Since Carolina didn't have any children of her own, she showered her maternal love on her niece and nephew, Olivia and Omar. Omar was 14 years older than Olivia, and her aunt told her that he was not her full brother, but a half-brother. For a long time, Olivia couldn't grasp the difference between these terms and would ask her aunt. And Carolina, if he's a half-brother, is he not a real brother? Olivia, Omar is your real brother. You just have different fathers. While the little girl tried to digest this news, her relative, paying no attention to her confusion, continued her narrative. Your mother was unlucky. It was all because of her stubbornness and foolishness. Her first husband, Omar's father, was such a good man, but Sarah neglected him, and a neighbor, David, took him away. Sarah was left alone with Omar, but she didn't learn her lesson. She almost immediately brought Michael, your father, into the house. At first, they lived together without being married, but then you were born, and they had to formalize their relationship. Six-year-old Olivia, though she understood the meaning of her aunt's words, asked just to be sure. And Carolina, did they get married? Yes. Was my dad bad too? How would I know? He seemed fine, but he got into a scrape. He ran over a person. He used to work on a construction site, hauling bricks and sand with a truck. An accident happened during one of those trips. People said the injured person was partly at fault. 
He darted onto the road at a bend, and Michael didn't see him. Did the man die? He did. If he had survived, your father would have gotten 10 years in prison. The victim's relatives made an effort, and the whole situation turned into a dark story. From her aunt, Olivia learned that her father sent letters from prison. A few times, Sarah left for several days, and Aunt Carolina readily told the girl why her older sister was absent. They allowed a visit with Michael, so your mother went. She loves him and is waiting for his release. Olivia was eagerly awaiting her father as well. She was in the third grade when a new tragedy struck their family. One spring day, returning from school, the girl found her mother in tears. The woman embraced her daughter. Olivia, your dad passed away, didn't make it to his release. He had less than two years left. If Sarah had been holding on before, she completely lost interest in life after this blow. She hadn't even recovered from the tragedy when her elder son presented her with an unpleasant surprise. Olivia heard Omar reproaching their mother. I've had enough. I don't want to come home because all I find here are accusations and your tears. Mom, I've long noticed that I'm superfluous in this house. First, you cared about your Michael, and now you won't leave Olivia alone. The girl heard it all and decided to stand up for her mother. She stormed into the room where this confrontation was taking place and shouted, Omar, you're lying. Mom is hardly ever home because she's working a lot, and you do nothing all day long instead of helping her. You're hurting her. Her brother lunged at the younger sister, but Sarah shielded her daughter. Don't you dare touch her. Don't vent your failures on your sister. You slink around, lays about all day. If you're planning to leave, I won't stop you. Her brother swiftly turned and grabbed his backpack. At the doorway, he turned and said with disdain, I swear I'll never set foot in this house again. It'll never happen. Omar easily disowned his mother and sister, but he kept his promise. He didn't write or call. After his scandalous departure, their mother began to fade slowly. She would disappear at work all day, hardly talking to Olivia in the evening. Sarah stopped caring about the state of the house. Still, that was something Olivia could manage herself, even learning to cook. One day, during her regular cleaning, Olivia discovered empty wine bottles hidden behind the wardrobe. When her mother returned from work, she showed her the discovery, expecting an explanation. Instead, she faced a vehement reaction. Olivia, why do you go where you're not wanted? The girl was momentarily perplexed, but then a dreadful suspicion struck her. Mom, is this your wine? Are you the one drinking it? Sarah's eyes flashed with anger, but she didn't respond at that moment. She became increasingly closed off and stopped showing an interest in her daughter's affairs. Olivia confided in her end about everything, and her end admonished her sister right in front of her niece. Sarah, what are you doing? You need to live for your daughter. Think about what will happen to her if you lose your parental rights. And that's bound to happen if you don't stop drinking. If you're having trouble handling this on your own, I'll help you. I don't need any helpers. Besides, I'm doing just fine. You'd be better off minding your own personal life instead of lecturing others. Carolina was deeply hurt after the argument with her sister and didn't visit their home for a long time. Unfortunately, the serious conversation didn't lead Sarah to reevaluate her life. However, she stopped hiding her drinking from her daughter, consuming a bottle of wine every evening after work before going to sleep. This destructive habit began to take a toll on the family budget, and there came a day when there was no bread left in the house. But on her way home, Sarah didn't forget to visit the store and bought alcohol with their last money. When she placed the wine on the table, Olivia cried out of desperation. Mom, we don't even have any bread, and you're buying this poison. You didn't even ask if I had eaten anything today. If you don't stop drinking, I'll leave home too, just like Omar. The girl was overwhelmed with despair and shouted these words, but her mother didn't flinch. She seemed to be petrified. Sarah steered at the bottle standing before her for a long time then opened it and poured its entire contents down the sink. 
Afterward, she went to bed and said in the morning, Sweetie, I promise I won't drink alcohol anymore. I won't be able to bear it if you leave me too. She managed to overcome her destructive addiction, but her already fragile health began to deteriorate rapidly. This is why Carolina had to move in with her sister. Sarah cried when her sister showed up with two suitcases. Well, I've decided to move in with you for a while. Sarah guessed the reason for the move. Carolina, why make such sacrifices? Olivia and I are managing just fine on our own. Sarah, you're my sister, and I can't leave you alone in your time of need. Olivia needs help. She has to finish school and go to college. Despite her mother's serious illness, having her in around made life a bit brighter. Carolina assisted her niece not only with household chores, but also bought her many beautiful clothes. Olivia, remember, a self-respecting woman should take care of herself from head to toe. Her wardrobe should also be appropriate. It's better to have only two dresses of good quality. When Olivia showed up at the school dance in her new outfit, not even her teachers and classmates recognized her immediately. Her fashionable dress was complemented by a stylish hairstyle. She walked with her head held high, and enthusiastic cheers followed her. Is that really Olivia? Changing so much in just one day, it's like a fantasy. That autumn ball became a lifelong memory for Olivia. The entire evening, she received admiring looks. Peter invited her to every dance. Many girls sighed over this young man. But Peter had stayed away from the fairer sex as he was completely immersed in his studies. Two years ago, after finishing school, he had entered a technical university to study automation of technological processes. He ended up at the beloved school's autumn ball purely by chance. As he later confessed to Olivia, I don't usually like such events, but our classmate dragged me along. But now, I don't regret giving in to his persuasion. Peter didn't hide his feelings for Olivia. Tomita's beloved, he would make a weekly 200-kilometer journey, one way. Her school friends were burning with envy. Olivia, you're so lucky to have met a guy like him. Peter is a future genius, they would say. But this envy had a brighter side to it. Only one person, Jennifer, harbored a deep hatred for Olivia. Jennifer was in a parallel class and was constantly surrounded by crowds of admirers. She was used to being the center of attention, and having a rival in Olivia was a difficult trial for her. Jennifer decided to teach Olivia a lesson, and the perfect way to do it was to steal Peter. To achieve this goal, Jennifer enrolled in the same college where Peter was studying. It took some time, but after a few months, Peter surrendered. Olivia would remember the day for the rest of her life when her beloved showed up at their home, accompanied by Jennifer. Olivia had spent a sleepless night by her dying mother's bedside, so she didn't immediately grasp what was happening. Peter, it's great that you came. My aunt and I need some help, Olivia said. But instead of the young man, Jennifer replied, yeah, and do you and your aunt need anything else? Olivia looked at Peter in confusion and he avoided eye contact. Taking advantage of the situation, Jennifer decided to express everything she thought about her rival. I won't allow my boyfriend to serve arrogant people like you, Olivia. And remember for the future, if you try to stand in my way, I'll trample over you. And Carolina, in the kitchen, was preparing herbal tea for her ailing sister. She had heard everything and decided to have her say. To strengthen her argument, she walked into the hallway with a rolling pin in her hand. Get out of here, both of you. Carolina literally pushed the couple out the door and told her niece, Don't let such trifles bother you. A real man would never let a woman control him. It so happened that the breakup with her beloved coincided with her mother's death. However, the second tragedy overshadowed the first, and Olivia quickly forgot about Peter. Only the thorn of betrayal remained in her heart. Jennifer's parents managed to throw a lavish wedding, leaving their own parents burdened with debts. This event, by the rules of the genre, took place secretly and adhered to strict rules of secrecy. 
The parents of the newlyweds mourned for a while, but eventually forgave their children's inattractive act. To help the newlyweds settle into their new life, they gave up their last savings. At first, Odette was dismayed by the modest accommodation. However, her young husband assured her, it's only the beginning. You can't imagine how inventive my mind is. Trust me, before you know it, we'll be living together in a small, but our own, apartment. Jane's predictions were spot on. He spent his days engaged in activities Odette knew nothing about. The enterprising young man delved into the world of currency exchange and money trading. However, his venture in this field didn't last long, as there was fierce competition and a high risk to life in this new market. But James had a well-developed intuition, and he could sense danger from miles away. When he had amassed a significant sum of money, the mechanism suddenly kicked in. He abruptly left this line of work and joined a real estate company. After just three months on the job, he found an affordable apartment and rushed to share the news with his wife, who was already expecting their first child. Odette, get ready to move. A chance like this comes once in a lifetime. We'll celebrate our new home and our son's birth there. Odette didn't inquire into the details, as she wasn't accustomed to pestering her husband with unnecessary questions. As the head of the household commanded, she packed up all their belongings. Before the couple could move their belongings, Odette went into labor. Instead of a son, a daughter was born, and the new father couldn't take his eyes off this little miracle. Odette, she's a beauty. In short, their move to the new apartment was hasty and didn't go without some trouble. But James quickly resolved the issue with the help of his connections. No one born yet will be able to outsmart James became his life motto. For the sake of money, he could engage in any endeavor without a hand of conscience. However, he always maintained his vigilance. Thanks to his caution, he never got caught up with law enforcement, despite his years of living on the edge. However, their family was never enriched by this way of life. Jennifer, his daughter whom he had no great affection for, was about 13 years old when he realized he couldn't achieve his elusive goal. So he began to instill in his heiress that it was she who should fulfill his dream. Jennifer, your father simply ran out of time, and I've made a lot of mistakes, but I've gained invaluable experience. I can tell you that you shouldn't waste time on trivial matters. You should aim for a big game. Women like you have an infallible asset beauty. Indeed, Jennifer was blessed by nature, and she was already turning heads back in elementary school. At the age of eight, the young girl was already adept at using her beauty, and her father was quite pleased. Our Jennifer will definitely captivate some oligarch. I'm 150% sure of it, and you know how intuitive I am. Odette didn't share her husband's enthusiasm, and in her heart, she was against him setting their daughter on an impossible path. However, her opinion held no weight within the family, and she remained silent. Years went by, and James distanced himself completely from his dangerous business. Like an upright family man, he found employment at a household appliance manufacturing plant. He earned a decent income, but a significant portion of it went to Jennifer's education and wardrobe. Initially, everything went according to the plan James had laid out. But during her third year of college, Jennifer got involved with a married man. Although her lover held a prominent position in society, he had no intention of leaving his family. To break the resistance of his lover, Jennifer decided to take an extreme step. She believed that she could bind her beloved with a child. The man's legal wife couldn't have children, and this advantage should lead her to victory. But her lover chose his wife with who he had spent over 10 years. Jennifer was in despair and didn't immediately tell her parents about her misfortune. When Odette learned that her daughter was pregnant by a married man, she nearly lost her composure. The usually calm woman yelled at her daughter, what were you thinking when you got involved with a man who could be your father? Do you think you're the only one? There are plenty of beauties out there and they all want oligarchs. Jennifer listened to her mother's scolding but didn't shed a tear. 
She had already made up her mind about everything. Mom, don't worry about our family's reputation. This child won't be born. Odette fell silent and looked at her daughter with surprise. Jennifer, you don't feel sorry for it. For whom? Well, this little one who won't be born. Mom, you told me yourself that for the greater goal, sacrifices must be made. I sacrificed my love first. Remember Peter? I took that guy from another girl because I really liked him. But then I realized that life with such a man would be difficult. I dumped him myself, even though my heart resisted. Now I must sacrifice our first child. I don't know what punishment awaits me for this sin. After that conversation, Odette understood that her daughter was much stronger than her. Jennifer was well into her pregnancy, and all the doctors she approached refused to perform an abortion. The only way out of this situation was to turn to an underground private clinic. But this step almost led to fatal consequences. On the third day after a poorly executed procedure, Jennifer's temperature suddenly spiked. Doctors fought for her life for nearly a month. But their verdict was a sentence for Jennifer. Unfortunately, you will never be able to have children. For two months, the young woman recovered from the shock. She had to switch to a correspondence program at her college. The period of mourning was short, and she slightly adjusted her personal plan, wholeheartedly forging her future once again. She realized that, at first, she should focus on her career growth. With some practical experience in management, she effortlessly found employment at one company and later moved to Skyline. But this transition wasn't hasty as is often the case with young girls lured by the prospect of extra cash in hand. Jennifer had previously gathered information about the company's owner, which fully satisfied her. Jesse, the owner, welcomed the new employee warmly. I'm delighted, Jennifer, that you've decided to join us. I've heard only positive reviews about you, and I hope your professional experience will benefit our company. The young woman listened to her new boss and realized that Jesse was a tough nut to crack. But she wasn't one to back down. During that period, Jesse was going through a personal tragedy. He had lost his wife due to what seemed like a bizarre accident. The young woman had a toothache, and she managed it with painkillers for several days. When her cheeks swelled, at her husband's insistence, she went to see a dentist. Unfortunately, she ended up in the chair of a less experienced specialist who, without consulting his colleagues, decided to drain the abscess. After the operation, the woman felt some relief. But a few hours later, her condition worsened. Her temperature spiked again, and she experienced seizures. Worried, her husband called an ambulance and received a scolding from the medical professionals. Based on all symptoms, your wife has meningitis, and only a miracle can save her, an astonishing lack of care. It's as if educated people like you are so indifferent to their own health. The man tried to convince the medics that his wife's illness was related to the poor tooth treatment, but they brushed him off, saying, don't talk nonsense. For nine days, the intensive care doctors tried to pull the young mother from the clutches of death, but this battle didn't end in favor of the medical professionals. On the 10th day, the woman passed away. When the grieving widower received the medical report, he nearly lost consciousness. However, he decided to seek the truth and headed to the chief physician of the medical facility. I demand an investigation and punishment for those responsible. My wife didn't die due to her own negligence. It was your doctor's fault. It all started after her dental treatment. The chief physician impatiently interrupted the visitor, saying, I understand your grief, but it's not right to blame a healthy head for an aching tooth. We have highly qualified specialists here. Besides, a lethal outcome from a tooth problem is something out of science fiction. The medical professional openly mocked the man, and Jesse barely managed to restrain himself from giving the smug chief physician a piece of his mind. But before leaving the office, Jesse issued a warning. Don't think I'll let this go. I don't believe in your doctor's conclusions, and I will involve independent experts. In response, the chief physician simply said, I'm sure they'll tell you the same thing. 
you're just wasting your money. In your case, the right decision is to accept it. However, the businessman had no intention of giving up. He filed a lawsuit against the medical facility. An independent examination confirmed that the incorrectly treated abscess led to the inflammatory process in the brain and the subsequent damage to the whole body. As a result of the legal proceedings, the hospital's chief physician lost his position due to his arrogance, and the dentist who botched the operation received a real prison sentence and a ban on professional practice. Of course, this didn't bring the young woman and mother of the one-year-old child back to life. Jesse was left with a small daughter on his hands. At first, his deceased wife's mother helped him, but she initiated some unsavory games behind his back. One day, upon returning home, he encountered the housekeeper whom his deceased wife's mother had recommended and whom he trusted completely. By unstrained expression, the businessman understood that something extraordinary had happened in the house. He was the first to ask, Anne, has something happened? The woman was hesitant and initially denied, saying, No, Jesse, everything is fine, but I can see from your eyes that you want to tell me something. This is confirmed by the fact that you're still here. You usually leave by six o'clock, and it's almost nine now, and kept glancing towards the children's room where the late wife's mother was looking after little Stacy. Jesse's observant eye didn't miss this. And let's go to my office and talk privately, he suggested. The housekeeper prepared to follow the host. But at that moment, Paula appeared. Jesse, you're home already. You seem quite early today, she said. Does it bother you? Jesse replied. Their relationship had never been smooth, and he had been reluctant to involve Paula in raising their daughter. Still, his late wife's mother had implored him to allow her to take care of her granddaughter, and he reluctantly agreed. For a while, Jesse had hoped that they could improve their relationship, but he saw through Paula's feigned kindness, realizing it was insincere. Noticing the housekeeper with her son-in-law, Paula raised her delicate eyebrows suggestively. I thought you, Anne, would be home by now. What made you break your usual routine? She asked. Jesse answered this question, saying, I asked Anne to stay back. We need to discuss some household matters. How interesting, very interesting, Paula responded. After discussing some important household matters with the housekeeper, spare me a moment. I have something to tell you too. Jesse expected any kind of mischief from Paula, but what Anne informed him of left him in shock. According to the housekeeper, Paula was contemplating taking his granddaughter away. Jesse, I heard it with my own ears as she called a friend, asking about the steps to terminate a father's parental rights. He was stunned. He scrutinized the housekeeper's face intently. And, are you sure you understood correctly? No, no, I understood everything correctly. I'm not trying to slander your relative. She's genuinely planning something malicious against you. Thank you, Anne, for the heads up. Jesse was a straightforward man, and he couldn't tolerate treachery in any form. After a brief conversation with the housekeeper, he threw open the door to the children's room. Paula, you better leave. Little Stacy was engrossed in playing with her dolls, and her grandmother lay on the couch, watching a TV series. She didn't even turn around just waved her hand dismissively. Jesse, wait. Important events are unfolding here. Jesse walked through the room and blocked the TV screen. Paula, there will be a replay tomorrow morning and you can finish watching the new episodes at your own home. Right now, I'm asking you to leave my house. The woman jumped up, her attractive face contorted with a grimace of hatred. What are you saying? It's your house. And didn't my late daughter deserve the right to live here? The man was unpleasantly surprised. You're planning to divide my property. How didn't I realize it right away? Why were you so eager to look after my granddaughter? Were you planning to take my daughter and then sue for a share of the estate? A sinister plan, I must say. The elderly woman looked around in confusion, initially heading toward her granddaughter, but Jesse quickly scooped the child into his arms. We no longer need your help. Please gather your things. I will call a taxi for you. Jesse, you'll regret throwing me out. Paula warned. For a long time after Paula's shameful departure, 
The man feared she might carry out her threats. So he strongly urged Anne, who now took care of little Stacy, not to take her eyes off the child during outdoor walks. However, Paula never returned. About a year passed since her expulsion. Stacy was already attending daycare. Jesse himself dropped off the little girl in the morning, and Anne would pick her up. One day, the housekeeper informed him, Jesse, Paul is seriously ill. Perhaps you could visit her. Did she ask for that herself? Or is this your personal initiative? Jesse inquired. Anne lowered her gaze and admitted, I went to see Paula yesterday. She has a severe pancreatitis flare-up. She's suffering a lot, and she's remorseful for her ill intentions. Jesse sighed. I don't believe in my dear relative's repentance. But you, Anne, you're a very kind woman. I can't do otherwise. That's how my parents raised me. I always taught my own sons to be kind. The man smiled. All right. Tomorrow, after daycare, we'll visit your grandmother. Stacy, do you want to see your grandma? The little girl looked at her father, then at the housekeeper. No, I want to be with Anne. Grandma was always watching TV and didn't want to play with me. The housekeeper gave the host an odd look. Jesse, please don't take my words as impertinence, but it pains me to see you struggling alone. You're still very young, a very interesting man. Why don't you find a good woman? Stacy needs a mother. The businessman took his home assistant's words as motherly advice. Their conversation took place in the kitchen, and he sat on the edge of the sofa. And I sometimes ponder over this question myself. Finding a wife is possible, of course, but as for a mother for my daughter, I'm afraid I might make a mistake. I fear that my wrong decision could mar Stacy's life. Don't be so quick to judge. Not all women are bad, and reassured him. Agree, but I don't know how to find the one who would be a reliable life partner. Anne's advice made the successful businessman seriously contemplate his unfulfilled life. Naturally, like any normal man, he didn't reject the idea of dating women, but these relationships were usually non-committal. Still, the topic of loneliness often took center stage even in business discussions. One day, Mr. Robert, a friend in both life and business, proposed after an important event, Jesse. It's been a while since we hung out and relaxed together. I wouldn't mind having some fun right now, but I have a little daughter. By the way, I have two boys myself, and my wife's keeping an eye on me every hour, trying to catch me cheating. But you know that I'm steadfast, or at least steadfast in relationships with ladies. The joke hit the mark, and the men laughed heartily. But Robert wasn't giving up. Jesse, seriously, Let's at least have a beer. There's a decent bar nearby. We can sit, chat a bit. Robert was five years older than Jesse, but this insignificant age gap didn't hinder their friendship. With the help of his older friend, Jesse started his own business. At the time, various services and trade were highly popular, and Robert advised, Jesse, we live in the age of technological progress. Every year, Something new comes up, and the average citizen can't keep up with these innovations. And most people fall into that category. So, are you suggesting I venture into this niche? Exactly. You're a specialist. I have a gut feeling that it's a foolproof venture. Jesse listened to Robert's advice and initially opened a company for repairing various types of technology. Later, he expanded the range of services and eventually hired top-level specialists to create software for various industrial needs. Repairing complex machinery was also among their services. When Robert decided to acquire a dying sewing factory, Jesse helped him install imported equipment. Their first joint project yield did a positive outcome. After that, the friends entered into close collaboration. However, the business consumed all their time, and they met less and less just for the sake of casual conversation. Therefore, Robert's proposal was joyfully accepted by Jesse after brief hesitation. Jesse informed the housekeeper that he would be a bit late and headed to the bar with Robert. They settled at the farthest table to have a quiet conversation. 
Robert wasted no time. Jesse, let's make a pact not to discuss business tonight. All right, agree. But then what should we talk about? Robert took a few satisfying sips from his large mug. Great beer. So, what shall we discuss? How about your personal life? And don't look at me like that. I'm your friend and your senior, so I have every right to offer advice. Jesse chuckled. I have a feeling you didn't bring me here for no reason. Robert didn't hide his intentions. You're right. I do have a secret plan to sort out your personal life. Robert, I think I can handle that on my own when the time comes. No, Jesse, you're mistaken. When you finally decide, it might be too late. How old are you now? 36, I guess. Still quite young. You're flattering yourself. Five more years, and not a single young woman will even look at you. Isn't 40 the prime age for a real man? Not the prime, certainly. But it's a fact that most modern women only pay attention to older men for selfish reasons. There's a lot of gold digging going on these days. That's the trend. Love is no longer a priority. Robert took another sip and unexpectedly burst into laughter. You know, I've never had the habit of reading other people's correspondence. But the other day, I accidentally peeked at my wife's Facebook page. My computer was on, and she hadn't logged out. Long story short, my wife's acquaintances, both known and unknown, envy me. They've elevated me to an oligarch status when I'm just an average businessman. These are the trends nowadays. Love is no longer a topic. It's for that very reason, Robert, that I'm wary of serious relationships. I won't hide it. I want to see a woman by my side who will love me, not my wallet. But where can I find such a woman? Robert closed his eyes for a few seconds and then exclaimed, under my guidance, Many women were. Among them, there are plenty of singles. I could have you compile a list of potential brides for me right now. Robert was gearing up for an impassioned speech, but Jesse stopped him. I also have no shortage of women in my circle. Firstly, I strictly adhere to the cardinal rule. No relationships at work. And secondly, Robert inquired. The second point aligns with the first. Jesse. If I understand you correctly, you have your eye on a specific lady, but you're taking your time. Is that it? Not exactly, but close. Robert tensed up. And who is this mysterious lady? I won't tell you for now. You'll keep it a secret and immediately report everything to your Robin. She'll rush to share it with her friends. I'm not yet entirely sure she's the right woman for me. The men's conversation turned out to be beneficial for both of them. The mood was great, and Jesse decided to take a leisurely walk. He signaled to his driver, You're off duty for today. I'll take a walk, he said. In addition to the many rules Jesse followed, there was one more. He didn't use the company's transportation for personal purposes. So, every morning, he would drive his own car out of the garage. Jesse strolled through the evening streets pondering his conversation with Robert. As an experienced hunter, Jennifer knew not to spook her prey. She had spent several years paving her way to her boss's heart. This strategy bore fruit. Jesse had complete trust in her. In the first year, he kept a close eye on the new employee, but she meticulously carried out her tasks and his personal assignments. As a result, he promoted her, taking the role of the head of the management department Jennifer gained more confidence and began to show initiative. Her actions didn't go unnoticed by the boss, and Jesse started consulting her on various production matters. One day he admitted, Jennifer, I haven't made a mistake in you. You're my right hand, and I want our cooperation to continue. Thank you, Jesse, for acknowledging my modest abilities. I'll do my best to live up to your trust, Jennifer responded. Of course, Jennifer was pleased to hear such words from her boss, but she desired more. She couldn't afford to stoop to mere flirtation. Therefore, she chose a different path to conquer the seemingly unassailable peak named Jesse. She found that path. After his wife's death, the businessman became deeply involved in philanthropy. 
representatives of various foundations and volunteers frequently visited their company. Often, Jesse would personally take part in charity events, and later, he began involving Jennifer in such activities. One day, just before Christmas, they went to a children's oncology center with gifts. Jesse watched with a beating heart as his assistant handed out presents to the sick children. Her eyes shone with happiness, and in those moments, she looked exceptionally beautiful. When they returned to the office, Jesse said, Jennifer, today I admired you. I didn't even suspect that you love children so much. It's a natural feeling for every woman. And really, how can one not love children? Her voice sounded convincing, and he believed her. Jennifer felt it through her skin, and her heart rejoiced. It seemed that the impregnable wall had cracked. But there was no room for complacency. Jesse couldn't read minds, and inspired by this beautiful woman's confession, he began telling her about his daughter. When I'm in places like that, I always see my Stacy in front of my eyes. That's why I want to do something good for these unfortunate kids. How old is your daughter? Jennifer inquired. She'll be seven soon. And how do you manage work and taking care of her on your own? I have reliable assistant. Her name is Anne. Jennifer felt her heart pound in her chest. But Jesse explained with a smile. My mother recommended this woman to me a while ago, and I have no regrets hiring her. Anne is like a mother, grandmother, and chef for both Stacy and me, all in one. She handles any task, and I can't imagine what I would do without her. Jesse, but despite all her qualities, a housekeeper can't give you the most important thing, Jennifer replied. The man looked at her intently, and in that gaze, Jennifer sensed something more than mere curiosity. After a brief pause, Jesse responded, you're right. I'm just an ordinary man, and I won't deny that I want a complete family. Lately, I've been thinking about it more and more. Are you dreaming of finding a woman who would be a loving wife for you and a good mother for Stacy? But you're afraid of making a mistake? Jennifer asked. The car suddenly braked in front of the office. Jesse, with the same intense gaze, looked at Jennifer for a long moment, and she didn't avert her eyes. Although Jesse didn't directly answer her question, her intuition told her that he was hooked. Jesse exited the car first and opened the door on her side. Be careful, Jennifer. It's slippery here, he said. Thank you, Jesse, she replied. She offered him her hand, and together they headed towards the building's entrance. Before parting ways to their respective offices, Jesse said, Today is an extraordinary day. It opened up something to me that I never realized before. Jesse, if you ever need my help again, don't hesitate to ask, Jennifer replied. Since then, Jennifer became Jesse's faithful companion during charity events. However, office workers had already speculated about the nature of their relationship. Even though Jennifer didn't participate in office gatherings and wasn't concerned with office gossip, but she too felt that there was more to come. She didn't have to wait long. Literally, the day after the holidays at the Children's Oncology Center, Jesse invited her to dinner at a restaurant. Her boss waited for her in his car in the office parking lot, fully visible to all employees. This made it clear that his intentions were quite serious. This suspicion was soon confirmed when Jesse invited her for a weekend trip. It was the height of spring when Jesse, as if casually, asked, Jennifer, what kind of leisure do you prefer? Taking a guess, she replied, I love spending time in nature. I enjoy rivers and everything associated with them. I propose a more accessible option. My friend, the one you know well, Robert, has a cottage not far from the city. There are beautiful places there too, and even a river, Jesse suggested. Jennifer noted to herself that their relationship was gradually shifting from professional to romantic. When they arrived at their destination, Jennifer was surprised to see a log cabin. The men headed to the clearing, where Robert and Robin's sons were already playing. The women remained in the gazebo. Robin offered, you must be tired from the journey. Take a break, and I'll handle the salads. No, I'm not tired at all. Let me help, Jennifer replied. All right, Robin said. 
Jennifer knew that Robin would start asking her about her life and her relationship with Jesse. But the hostess kept slicing vegetables silently, occasionally glancing at her guest. When the chopping was nearly done, Robin said with sadness in her voice, I was friends with Jesse's first wife. We were like sisters. I couldn't believe it when she was gone. Losing loved ones is very hard. Jennifer remained silent. She understood that earning Robin's trust would be difficult. After a long pause, Robert's wife asked, Have you met Stacy yet? Jennifer struggled to say, Not yet. As I understand it, you don't have any children of your own either, Robin inquired. That's correct. I couldn't build a family. The person I blindly trusted betrayed me. It took me a very long time to recover from that blow. Of course, Jennifer couldn't tell Robin that in her youth, she had tried to break up another family. She couldn't even imagine the reaction such a confession would receive. Once again, Robin directed a penetrating gaze her way. Yes, it's difficult to endure betrayal, Robin stated. With that, the candid conversation came to a close. Robin turned her attention back to the table and declined Jennifer's help. She then shifted her focus to the boys, leaving Jennifer to spend time with the two men. Late at night, Robin asked Jennifer, Do you and Jesse want to share a room? No, it's better if we have separate rooms, Jennifer replied. Whatever you say, Robin acquiesced. After Robin left, Jennifer couldn't help but feel unsettled. She thought to herself, She didn't accept me. Robin, you're a woman, and you understand women's hearts better. Just tell me in a few words, what do you think of Jennifer? Jesse asked. All right, I'll tell you since you insist. But don't be offended. She's undeniably beautiful and well-mannered. But there's something about her that's off-putting. I can't quite put my finger on it. Maybe it's her eyes. They seem cold. Robin responded. Robin, I think you might be nitpicking, Jesse replied. Perhaps that's true, Jesse. You have to decide for yourself in these matters. You don't need advisors, Robin concluded. Jesse realized it was time to make a decision. During another dinner, he made a proposal to Jennifer. Jennifer had mentally rehearsed this scene many times. However, contrary to her expectations, Jesse's words were simple. Jennifer, we are both mature adults, so I think all the fuss is unnecessary. I like you and I can see that the feeling is mutual. Will you marry me? Jennifer stared at the businessman with wide eyes, struggling to discern her predominant emotion, joy, or astonishment. It wasn't the kind of proposal she had expected. Jesse awaited her response. Jennifer, I'm sorry that this happened so spontaneously, but it comes from the heart. You know, I don't like grand speeches and ceremonies, he added. Jennifer had already regained her composure. She wiped away a tear gracefully and replied, Jesse, I'm overwhelmed. This is so unique and beautiful. I agree. Pleasant wedding preparations commenced, and Jennifer immersed herself in the process. She tried not to dwell on how Jesse's proposal had seemed somewhat lacking in sentiment. Her entire focus was on the fact that she would soon bear his name. However, the one person missing from the grand plans of the businessman's future wife was Jessie's little daughter. Jennifer's chance encounter with her former rival didn't leave her ineffective. She longed to share her joy with someone, but she hadn't made any friends in her workplace. All her old connections had long been severed. The only person left was Olivia. Jennifer concluded that she needed another meeting with Olivia. Since Olivia hadn't left her phone number, she decided to approach Jessie directly. Jessie, I have a huge favor to ask you, Jennifer began. Jesse pulled himself away from some documents. I'll gladly fulfill any of your whims. The businessman took out his wallet, but Jennifer wrinkled her brow. Jesse, I don't need money. It's something entirely different. The other day, an old friend came by with a check. We went to school together. She works for a robber. We chatted for a bit, but I forgot to ask for her phone number. Maybe you can help me with that. We'll find your friend's contact in five minutes. I hope you'll introduce me to her, Jesse responded. Jennifer blushed at Jesse's request. Why do you want it? She asked. The businessman shrugged. 
I'm just curious about the social circle of my future wife. He was already reaching for his phone, but then something struck him, and he placed it back on the table. Jennifer, an idea just came to me. We have an important charity event coming up to support underprivileged children. I'll ask Robert to assign your friend to that. You can meet her there. By the way, I wrote the check out to Robert specifically for humanitarian purposes. Their company is facing temporary financial difficulties, and I couldn't say no to a friend. Jennifer couldn't help herself and said, Sometimes it's useful to say no. Jesse inquired, To what are you referring? She replied, Oh, nothing. Just thinking out loud. So should I call Robert then? Jesse asked, Yes, thank you for your help. Jennifer responded. Jennifer returned to her office and sank into her chair. Why do I even want to meet Olivia? Is it just to rub it in more for that failure? She pondered. At a glance, Jennifer knew that Olivia wasn't living a life of luxury. Her modest dress and a cheap pair of shoes were the telltale signs of a single mom struggling to make ends meet. Women in this category often stretch their finances to support their children, leaving very little for themselves. They saved for months to afford an upgrade and made do with second-hand items. Jennifer whispered to herself, I despise losers. Jennifer always found solace in the thought that someone had it worse than her. With Olivia, that feeling was doubly comforting. She pictured how stunned Olivia would be when she saw her in a luxurious outfit she had purchased in a fashionable Milan boutique. She would let the envy eat up the sewing workshop supervisor. Jennifer contorted her face into a disdainful smile. She was pleased that she had finally pinpointed the target of her intolerable desire to meet Tolevi again. Furthermore, she understood why charitable events drew her in. They allowed her to revel in her superiority over others. Throughout the day, Jesse was occupied, and Jennifer awaited his call. Finally, he rang. We're waiting in the parking lot. Come down, he said. The woman grabbed her white purse embellished with rhinestones and hurried to the elevator. She was stunned to see a little girl in the car. The young girl had neatly braided blonde hair and was dressed in a formal suit. Jennifer guessed that this was Jessie's daughter. Hello, Stacy, she greeted. The girl smiled and replied, Hi, and I know your name is Jennifer. Jennifer settled into the back seat next to the child. Jessie turned around. So, girls, are we all set? He asked. Stacy cheerfully exclaimed. Yes. Then let's go. Decent people shouldn't be late. Am I right, Stacy? Jesse inquired. Exactly. Daddy, Stacy agreed. Optimism radiated from the little girl. Not only was she speaking loudly, but she also couldn't sit still. Jennifer cautiously shifted away from her once, and then repeated the movement a second time. She thought that her maneuvers had gone unnoticed. However, Stacy's keen gaze didn't miss this change. Are you scared of me? The child asked. Jennifer let out a nervous chuckle. No, of course not. Why would I be afraid of you? I'm not scared of you either, Stacy responded. Once the safety situation was clarified, the girl shifted her attention to Jennifer's outfit. She gently touched the beaded silk skirt. Jennifer couldn't contain her emotions. Be careful. Don't touch it with your hands. You might get it dirty. Stacy withdrew her hand, looking hurt. My hands are very clean because Anne makes me wash them. The child moved away from Jennifer, clearly offended. Jesse observed everything but remained silent. Only when they had already arrived at the children's creative center where the event was taking place did he make a comment to his fiancée. You dressed a bit too extravagantly, Jennifer, and your purse looks a bit flashy. The woman didn't reply. However, her dissatisfaction was boiling inside her. Stacy grabbed her father's hand and pulled him toward the entrance. Dad, my friend from school is there with her mom. Let's go faster. Jennifer, wearing high heels, slowly followed them. The vast lobby was filled with people, and she lost track of her companions. Along the walls, there were stands displaying children's artwork, and she decided to check out some of the samples of children's creativity. But before Jennifer could take a few steps, 
She bumped into Olivia. Olivia exclaimed, good-naturedly, Jennifer, it seems like we've been running into each other quite frequently lately. This statement was made in a friendly and even humorous manner. Jennifer responded to her acquaintance in the same way. You know, I'm convinced that our meeting today is fateful. Maybe we can head straight to the hall or the refreshment area. A loud voice came from below. Mom, I'm thirsty. Olivia smiled and introduced. Meet my son, Cal. The six-year-old boy with a fashionable haircut extended his hand to Jennifer. She shook it with a smile. Pleasure to meet a real man. The young boy was flattered by the compliment, but didn't forget to ask a question of his own. Do you have your kids with you for the celebration too? Mom said it's going to be a lot of fun. Afterward, we're going to distribute gifts to less fortunate children with the other kids. Before the boy could elaborate on the event's program, Jesse appeared with his daughter. Jennifer, Stacy and I looked for you everywhere. We were wondering where you disappeared. He cast an attentive glance at Olivia. If I'm not mistaken, this is your friend, Olivia. Olivia looked surprised at Jennifer but extended her hand to the businessman. I'm Olivia. My boss asked me to attend the event. Since it's unknown how long it'll last, I had to bring my son along. She spoke as if apologizing for something, and her soft, velvety voice had a calming effect. Jesse wanted to have a conversation with this charming woman, but Jennifer kept a watchful eye on their interaction. Jesse, I think it's time for us to focus on the gifts. While the adults were getting acquainted and attending to their business, the children quickly found common ground. Stacy took Cal's hand and led him to a corner where a group of kids had gathered. Over there, they have hamsters, guinea pigs, and there's even a parrot in a cage. He's so funny, and he can sing. Let's hurry. Stacy answered as the eldest, taking charge. The parents watched their children as they hurried toward the petting zoo, and Jennifer felt a sense of complete isolation for the second time that evening. A thought crossed her mind. And why did you need this meeting? Did you want to show off in front of Olivia? The situation was becoming threatening, and Jennifer firmly took Jesse by the arm. Excuse me, Olivia. We need to discuss something. She led the businessman aside, talking and gesturing with her hands. Jesse glanced in Olivia's direction a few times, his interest evident in those looks. Olivia went to the petting zoo where Cal and Stacy were admiring the animals. Soon, a bell rang, and all the event participants made their way to the hall. Tired but filled with excitement, Olivia and Cal left the premises. The boy waved his hand and shouted loudly, Stacy, it was great. I had fun. Jesse and Jennifer were already getting into their car. Stacy bid farewell to her new friend with in disguised joy. Cal, I had fun too. Come visit us. The car slowly pulled away from the parking lot. Stacy continued to wait. Cal, with a demeanor beyond his years, began to share his impressions with his mother. Mom, you can't imagine how smart Stacy is. She's already going to the second grade, and I'm just in the first. Her mom died, and that's Aunt Jennifer, her stepmom. Olivia was taken aback by her son's statement. How do you know all this? Stacy told me. A real mom is better than a stepmom, right? Olivia didn't know how to respond, but her son impatiently asked, Mom, I don't want a stepmom. Our caregiver read us the story of Cinderella, and there was a wicked stepmom. So scary. Cal, don't be afraid. I'll always be with you. And not all stepmoms are mean. Some are very kind. The conversation with her son once again stirred memories in Olivia's heart. She recalled Jay, whom she met and quickly married. However, their marriage shattered into pieces shortly after Cal was born when her husband said, Olivia, forgive me, but I'm not ready for fatherhood. While Olivia was still coming to terms with these words, Jake packed his things and left. Till this day, Olivia has no idea where he is. Her aunt advised her to report him as missing and demand child support. But Olivia said, I won't stoop that low. I'll raise my son on my own. Carolina scolded her niece, but she couldn't change her mind. After that hastily arranged marriage, Olivia was even afraid to think about another marriage.
Although she did attract the attention of men, and some were quite persistent in courting her, she politely turned them down. For this, her aunt scolded her as well. You can't let happiness slip through your fingers. A woman's time is short, and there's nothing scarier than loneliness. Remembering her aunt's words, Olivia suddenly realized that Jennifer, despite her airs, was a very lonely person. She even felt sorry for her, but it was just a moment of weakness. When her old acquaintance reminded her of the upcoming wedding, Olivia politely declined, citing her son's illness, and, not hiding her irritation, was busy in the kitchen. The homeowners, Jennifer and her new husband, were not at home, so she could vent her frustrations freely. After Jennifer entered the house, everything turned upside down. The housekeeper had thought of quitting several times, but Stacy always managed to persuade her to stay. The relationship between the stepmother and the little girl did not improve, despite Stacy's efforts to win her father's wife over. It was impossible not to notice. However, Jennifer was clearly pushing the child away. Stacy, don't bother me. I don't have time to look at your drawings right now, she said, and herself had strained relations with the new mistress. Still, since the woman was not one to be trifled with, she quickly put Jennifer in her place when she tried to belittle her. Listen to me carefully, Jennifer. I didn't come from a garbage dump, and I'm just as educated as you are. So don't try to fight with me. You'll lose. The young businessman's wife adopted an innocent expression. What are you talking about? And don't pretend. You understand everything. And I want to warn you, just in case, I won't let you mistreat Stacy. Fate has already been unkind to her by taking her biological mother. Jennifer interrupted the housekeeper. You're being unfair to me. I'm trying to connect with the girl, but she shies away from me. You're way off track, Jennifer. Little children require a special approach. Stacy really wanted to see you as a loved one, but you didn't live up to her expectations. Indeed, everything was just as Anne described. At the father's wedding, Stacy was the angel in a white dress, according to the master of ceremonies. The girl was radiant with happiness and reached out to Jennifer. But even then, it was evident that the child was irritating the woman. A few weeks after the celebration, the girl complained about her stepmother for the first time. And, is it always the case that a stepmother mistreats children? The housekeeper asked with concern. Why do you ask? Because Jennifer is always scolding me. She says I didn't do something right, or I disturb her when she wants to relax. But I just want to do my best. Yesterday, I asked her to help me with a math problem, and she scolded me. Well, your new mom was probably just busy, and you interrupted her. Absolutely not. She was lying on the couch, and she's no mother at all. The girl was on the verge of tears, and Anne tried to console her. Stacy, why are you so upset? You can't cry over every little thing. Is it a little thing that Jennifer told me not to call her mom? The housekeeper was taken aback. She said that directly. Yes, she did. She also said that I'd be in trouble if I complained to dad. And what does I'd be in trouble mean? That's a bad word. You shouldn't repeat it. And realized that she needed to tell the owner everything. She had delayed several times to have a chance to talk to him but Jennifer was closely monitoring her. After the wedding, she had taken an indefinite leave and spent entire days in the apartment or going shopping. She didn't pay attention to the house's upkeep, and more responsibilities fell on the housekeeper. However, no matter how hard the new owner tried, Anne eventually managed to catch the owner. But it seemed like he was a different person. As soon as the woman began to speak, he interrupted her sharply. And you can't please you. First, you blamed everything on Paula, and now you don't like my wife. But Jesse, I'm worried about Stacy. Children her age are very sensitive. Your wife keeps mistreating the little girl. I think my wife and I can handle our family issues ourselves. This comment was a strong signal, and Anne decided not to continue the argument. She was afraid that the owner would simply kick her out. But with each passing day, the family situation became more tense, 
and the housekeeper felt that a storm was about to break. Her premonitions did not fail her. On that November day, she picked Stacy up from school a bit earlier because she had asked the teacher for permission. The girl was beaming with happiness, and then asked, Stacy, you're glowing. Did you get an A? No, Anne, look at what I made. The girl handed over her creation, resembling a greeting card. The front was adorned with three-dimensional paper flowers, and at the very top, two little angels sat and praised the girl. Great job, you made a beautiful car. Did you cut everything out yourself? No, the teacher helped a bit. But I wrote the message myself and enfolded the card and read, I want you to love me, Mom. Your daughter, Stacy. The woman felt something tremble inside and her eyes welled up. Stacy. Do you want to give your card to Jennifer? The girl nodded. Yeah, maybe she'll like my gift, and she'll love me. The housekeeper was astonished by the child's innocence. She understood that the child's hopes were in vain, but had no right to thwart the child's desire. After taking Stacy home, she heard from the hostess. And you can have the day off today. You don't need to come tomorrow either. We'll manage on our own. The woman went home sensing trouble. Only on Monday did she learn what had happened in Jessie's house after her departure. Stacy decided to give her present to Jennifer right away. Tomorrow is Mother's Day. I made a beautiful card for you. The stepmother looked at the card with surprise, then read the message. Stacy, love must be earned. There's nothing to love about you yet, so you can take your card back. She threw the card with such force that the little angels flew off. To emphasize her contempt for such gifts, the woman said with disgust, what an eyesore, and walked past the girl, deliberately stepping on the car. The girl pounced on it and started beating it with her fists, crying in hysteria. You're a mean stepmother. I'll never call you mom again. I'll tell my dad that you're bad. He'll kick you out. Jennifer's long-held anger erupted like volcanic lava. She roughly grabbed the girl by her jacket's hood. Just open your mouth. I'll strangle you. The girl started screaming, and the stepmother had to loosen her grip. Before Jennifer could close the door, Stacy, clutching the car to her chest, rushed out of the apartment. She ran down the street, fearing the pursuit of the hateful stepmother. However, she quickly became tired and found herself in an entirely unfamiliar place. People passed by, but no one paid any attention to her. Stacy realized that she didn't know the way back, and she became scared. She sat on a cold bench in the park and began muttering to herself in a half-whisper, Well, let me freeze and die, and then Dad will understand that this Jennifer is bad, and he'll kick her out. It's better to live without a mom than with such a wicked stepmother. An elderly woman walked by, stopped, and asked, Are you okay, little girl? Stacy responded cheerfully, Yes, I'm fine. The woman asked, why are you alone? Where are your parents? My mom is at the store. She'll come soon. The old lady looked at the little girl suspiciously and asked, are you not lying? No, lying is not good. For the first time, Stacy lied so brazenly, but she was very afraid that the old lady might call the police and they would take her to an orphanage. Time passed and dusk was setting in. Desperation gripped the little girl, and she broke into loud sobs. The darkest scenarios played out in her mind freezing to become an icicle or being attacked by stray dogs. Anne had recently read in the newspaper about a case where a girl was attacked and killed by dogs. Horror began to seep into every cell of Stacy's body, and she whimpered, Mama, I'm so scared. Save me. At the edge of despair, the little girl began calling her long-deceased mother. But unexpectedly, she heard a familiar voice very close by. Mom, come here quickly. This is the girl. You thought someone left the garbage bag. The girl fell silent and raised her eyes. She was the first to recognize the boy who called out. How? It was already dark, and the dim lamplight made it difficult to see their faces. But the boy recognized his little friend by her voice. Stacy. Mom, this is Stacy. Remember? We were at the holiday party, and there was a talking parrot and hamsters. 
Olivia rushed to the spot where the two friends met. At first glance, it was evident that the girl was severely cold. The woman grabbed the child. Stacy, how did you end up here all alone? I ran away because Jennifer attacked me, and she stomped on my car. What car, Stacy? But the girl didn't answer. The last few months had been an unbearable burden for the little Stacy, and the few hours spent in the cold had drained her of her last strength. Olivia stood there, bewildered, in the midst of the snowy park, wondering how to handle this situation. The right course of action was suggested by Cal. Mom, let's go home, or Stacy will get even colder. Yes, my dear, you're right. She needs warmth, and then we'll call her parents. Olivia led the girl, fearful to think what might have happened to Stacy if she and Cal had chosen a different route. The park path was shorter but only used in the summertime. Olivia, like any woman, was wary of potential dangers lurking in dark places. It was Cal who suggested taking the park route, and she had agreed. As a result, it was thanks to his vigilance that they saved Stacy. Jennifer was convinced that it would take only five or at most ten minutes, and the obnoxious girl would return, begging for forgiveness. She could already picture how Stacy would ask her for forgiveness. This scenario was so vivid that she mumbled through clenched teeth. Don't worry, you little brat. I'll teach you how to respect your elders. You'll become docile under my watch. But an hour passed, then another, and Stacy didn't reappear. Worry crept into the woman's soul, but she wasn't concerned for the child. She was worried about herself. What if Jessie found out that the little girl had run away because of her? What should she do? Maybe she's hiding somewhere nearby. To check her hunch, Jennifer put on her coat and set off in search of her stepdaughter. But the girl was nowhere to be found, and no one responded to her calls. The stepmother combed through all the neighboring yards, but they were all empty. She returned home, feeling powerless and desolate. She was afraid to call her husband. But then she remembered that she had the housekeeper's phone number. Of course, Stacy must have gone to the housekeeper, she thought. With trembling hands, she dialed the number and asked in a nervous and frightened voice. And, isn't Stacy with you by any chance? She asked for some time to go for a walk, but she hasn't returned yet. So, I thought she might have gone to your place. Jennifer heard a string of unflattering words from the housekeeper, but she couldn't afford to argue any longer. The clock showed 10 p.m., and at this time, Stacy should have been in bed. Her mind was working over time and her inner voice daunted her mockingly. Well, have you had enough? What if something happens to the girl? Her father will blame you. Out of despair, the woman let out a wail. It was at that moment that Jesse returned. He immediately rushed to his wife. Jennifer, what happened? You look terrible. Is something hurting you? Should I call an ambulance? The woman shook her head back and forth. Jesse, no need for an ambulance. I'm fine. Stacy has disappeared. She was gone while I was in the bath. The man stood in the middle of the spacious living room, unable to move. There was a sharp pain in his chest, and breathing became difficult. With great effort, he took a few deep breaths. Jennifer, honestly tell me what happened here in my absence. Why did my daughter run away from home? Stacy is only eight years old, and she's never had the urge to run away before. Did you provoke her? Jennifer backed towards the door. She had never seen her husband in such a state before. The thought crossed her mind that he might actually harm her. She was already planning to run out of the apartment, but Ian blocked her way. Let me pass, she said, but the housekeeper stood her ground. Jesse soon joined them and closed the door. It's better if you tell me everything, he said. The sooner we find Stacy, the better your chances of staying alive. Don't you understand? Stacy means everything to me. Jennifer cried out like at a funeral. Of course. And what about me? Who am I to you? Everyone in this house is against me. Stacy, the housekeeper, they're all conspiring to get me out. Can't you see that they've intentionally set this up to make you kick me out? Jennifer was convincing, and he looked at Anne with confusion. But she didn't remain silent. Aren't you ashamed? The child wanted to call you mom, and you prohibited it. 
Moreover, you told her not to tell her father, or else she'd regret it. How many times did she try to show you her drawings, which, by the way, depicted all three of you? But you didn't have time for her. You were either admiring yourself or chatting with your friends on the phone, and you simply shooed the girl away. And today, the housekeeper turned to Jesse. I picked up Stacy from school. Tomorrow is Mother's Day, and she made a card for you. It said, I want you to love me, Mom. She was going to give you this card. Jennifer rushed to Jesse, but I didn't see any card. I told you, it's all a setup, Jesse. You'll feel ashamed later for what you thought of me. The housekeeper took a step forward. What's this, then? She picked up small paper angels from the floor. These are from that very car. Jennifer saw her husband's eyes turn steely, and she yelled again. Why are you looking at me like that? She keeps bothering me all the time. Some drawings, some lessons, and now this car. How pitiful. The girl needs to acquire taste. As she behaves like a little annoying leech, she stopped herself, realizing that she shouldn't have said all that. Jessie approached her quietly and grabbed her by the throat. I hope you understand what will happen to you if something happens to my daughter. Now, go away. Jennifer needed no persuasion. She quickly rushed out the door, reasoning that it was better to wait out the situation in safety. Jessie took out his phone. We need to call the police. I'll also contact my security service. Anne could see that her boss was in bad shape. She quickly fetched water and handed him a glass, which he gratefully emptied. Olivia gently sat the little girl on the couch. Are you very cold? She asked. Stacy smiled and replied. Yes, but your hands are so warm. Let's take off your outer clothing while Cal puts on the kettle and warms up some soup. Cal quickly went to the kitchen. He can already turn on the stove by himself. Olivia asked. She smiled. I had to teach him. I work late you see. So he has to heat things up for himself. That's great. And doesn't let me do that. Olivia helped the girl take off her coat and noticed that the hood was almost torn off. She thought, could Jennifer really have done this? Then she's not just a bad person as Olivia knew her. She's also dangerous. Poor child. What she had to endure. Sweetheart, while Cal is setting the table, maybe you can tell me what happened. Olivia gently asked. Huge tears welled up in Stacy's eyes. You see, I really wanted to have a mom. A real one who would love me. And we'd all be happy together. Jennifer didn't like me. I tried to do things to make her like me. I brought her my drawings. They had dad, me, and her. But she didn't look at them. She wasn't interested. I showed her my diary. I have all A's in there. I thought she'd be proud of me. But she pushed me away. And when I called her mom, she screamed at me. She also told me not to complain to dad. But I wasn't planning to complain. You know, in school, everyone made cards for their moms. I thought if I made a beautiful card, Jennifer would like me, and she would love me. Look, I wrote it myself. Olivia took the crumpled card in her hands, read it, and almost burst into tears. She threw me down and stepped on me. She also said she doesn't love me and that there's no reason to love me. I told her I would tell my dad, and then she grabbed me and started shaking me. It hurts so much. Right here, the girl pointed at her chin, and Olivia was horrified to see several bruises, probably from the jacket zipper. She must have shaken you really hard to leave these marks, Olivia thought. She hugged the girl. Don't cry, please. You'll meet someone to who you can give this card, I promise. Stacy looked at her hopefully. Do you really think so? Of course. Are you hungry? Yes, very. Stacy timidly smiled. And at that moment, as if by magic, Cal entered the room. I've been waiting for you for ages. Mom, you usually tell me not to spill the hot soup. Olivia turned around and said with a laugh. Well, there you go. I was just praising you, saying you can do everything. Stacy laughed too. She gently placed the card under her jacket and approached Cal. Don't worry. They don't let me do anything at all. Stacy sighed sadly. Let's have dinner. And then we can tell your dad where you are. 
The girl got scared. No, let's not tell him right away. Dad looks at Jennifer with such eyes and told him about Jennifer and he yelled at her. He doesn't believe anyone except his Jennifer. Olivia sighed. She could imagine how worried Jesse must be at this moment. But then she thought that Stacy was right about something. Let her husband suffer a bit. How could he not see that his own child was in pain? Come on, my dear, I'll tuck you in, Olivia said out loud. In her thoughts, she decided that as soon as the girl fell asleep, she would immediately inform Jesse that his daughter was with her. The girl lay down, and Olivia covered her with a blanket. Stacy looked at her attentively. Tell me, do you have a has-been? Olivia smiled. No. Why? It would have been so nice if you could be my mom. Mine and Cal's. We'd be really good friends with Cal. Olivia was at a loss, unsure how to answer the child's question about having a has-been. However, Stacy had already fallen into a deep sleep, clutching her handmade car to her chest. Olivia gently adjusted the blanket, stood there thoughtfully for a moment, and then decisively headed to the kitchen. She had also laid Cal to rest in a large room, and her son had already closed his eyes. She needed to call Jesse. Olivia picked up her phone but hesitated, realizing that she didn't have Jesse's phone number. Meanwhile, Jesse was standing outside the house, utterly perplexed about which direction his daughter might have run off to. He imagined how she must have felt when a stranger shouted at her. The search was in full swing, with him having scoured his own yard for nearly 40 minutes, and, with a flashlight, was doing the same. She was holding out hope that the girl might be hiding in the gazebo, the empty pool, or somewhere else, but there was no sign of her. The search needed to be expanded, and where could she have gone? Jesse asked, if I knew Jesse. We've only ever walked to and from school. She wouldn't know any other way. In that case, we'll have to expand our search. Jesse understood that it was cold outside. He knew how much a young child fears the darkness. If she hadn't returned, it meant that she was either lost or something had happened to her. He couldn't bear to entertain the latter thought. In his agitated state, his mind conjured up terrifying scenarios making his hair stand on end. Periodically, he heard updates on his radio, which had been given to him for the search. Search parties were checking various locations, some quite far from their home. Panic was slowly creeping into Jesse's heart. Stacy, my dear, just be found. I'll always listen to you and pay attention to you. He kept repeating these words to himself like an incantation. They had been searching for about three hours, if not more, and the scope of the search had widened. They were now listing locations quite distant from their home. Jesse could sense the panic seeping into his soul. In his pocket, his phone vibrated. He grabbed it. It was Robert, an unexpected call at such a late hour. He must have heard on television that his daughter was missing. Hello, Jesse. What's happening? Why didn't you call me? Robert's voice was concerned. Stacy has disappeared. I didn't have time to make any calls, Jesse replied. Where are you right now? I'm here in the city. Get in your car. Olivia called me. Do you remember her? You met her at a charity event. She has your daughter. I don't know all the details, but she asked me not to make a fuss because the kids are asleep. She has a son too. Cancel the search and I'll send you the address. She didn't have your number, so she called me. Jesse felt his heart start beating again. Robert, did she say if Stacy is okay? Everything seems fine. She's asleep. Jesse disconnected the call and shouted to his housekeeper. Go home. I'll make the call. Stacy has been found. His housekeeper burst into tears, saying, My girl, I'm waiting for you, Jesse. He couldn't hear her anymore as he was on the phone calling off the search and simultaneously looking for a taxi on the road. Olivia leaped at the loud doorbell. Even though she had been expecting it, she was still startled. She opened the door, and Jesse practically rushed into her apartment. Where is she? He asked. Shh, be quiet. Stacy is asleep, she replied. She partially opened the door to the room, and Jesse quietly approached his daughter. He stood by her for a while then noticed the handmade card she was holding. 
Olivia walked up and gently placed her palm on the child's forehead and said thoughtfully, Don't wake her. They stepped into the kitchen. Jesse, feeling exhausted, sat down on a chair, covered his eyes for a moment, and then looked at Olivia, who was fussing with a kettle. You're Jennifer's friend, and you know her well, right? I understand you weren't particularly pleased to see her, Jesse said. I'd rather not go into details. I'll put it this way. Jennifer always gets what she wants. She doesn't care about the means. She'll do anything, Olivia responded. Jesse looked surprised. So, you're suggesting that she might have mistreated Stacy? Olivia looked at him in amazement, then placed a cup of tea in front of him. You know, you've really surprised me. I spoke with Stacy, and based on her stories, it seems her relationship with Jennifer didn't start off well. At our meeting, I got the impression that you love Stacy and pay more attention to her, but not noticing this. Jesse lowered his head. You're absolutely right. I had some kind of goal. I thought I needed to find Stacy's mother. Jennifer was acting so affectionate toward the children. When we got married and Jennifer moved in with me, I relaxed immediately. After all, now Stacy had a mother. They were supposed to find common ground. Jennifer is smart, beautiful, and you know, our housekeeper tried to tell me that things weren't all smooth, but I like to think that everything was fine. Olivia suddenly felt sorry for this man, crushed by his own actions. He had been through so much already, raising his daughter alone. She placed her hand on his. Don't worry, everything will work out. We'll figure it out. They both felt as if an electric shock had passed through their hands. Olivia pulled her hand away and looked embarrassed. I would offer you to stay, but I have nowhere to put you up, and I have to go to work in the morning, she said. Olivia, I'd like to take Stacy home with me. I'll bundle her up well, and I'll bring you the blanket tomorrow. Right now. I'll just call a cab, Jesse replied. Olivia initially wanted to object, but then she shrugged her shoulders. He's the father. He knows what's best. Twenty minutes later, Jesse walked out, holding his daughter tightly. At the door, he paused. I'm not saying goodbye, Olivia. You've done too much for us. Stop it. Anyone would help a freezing child, Olivia responded. In the morning, while making the bed where Stacy had slept, Olivia found that same car. Oh, I forgot. I need to return this, she thought. She wrapped the car to ensure nothing fell off and put it in her bag. She planned to give it to her boss, who would pass it on to his acquaintance. Outside her workplace, Hugh was waiting for her. She had to call him last night to get Jesse's phone number, but her boss only had Robert's number. He gave it to Olivia with a firm promise not to reveal where she got it. Olivia, everything is fine, isn't it? Hugh asked. Of course, Hugh. The owner himself showed up this morning, waiting for you in my office. She looked at the director with surprise. Why? He shrugged. How would I know? I'm surprised too. Since the child is fine, let's go, and you can change later. The director kept wiping his forehead with a handkerchief and Olivia felt sorry for him. Seeing Robert in person was different. She had only seen him in photos or on stage, but now he was right in front of her. Well, hello, Olivia. Hello, Robert. I'm proud to have such talented workers at my factory. You have a son, right? Olivia looked at him warily. Yes, I do. Don't be alone. I come in peace. You see, Jesse is my friend and I was worried about his daughter just as much as I would be for my own children. I thought I should express my gratitude to you. No, there's no need. No gratitude is necessary. Olivia reached into her bag and handed him the car. Please pass this to Stacy. She left it with me. Okay, I'll pass it all along. And I want to say, you can't refuse when the boss wants to show appreciation. Here, this is for you. He handed her something, too. It was an envelope. What's this? Olivia mechanically opened it and gasped. How did you know? Robert smiled contently. Well, how can you not know that boys at that age love skiing and snowboarding? Olivia sighed. Her son was obsessed with skiing. 
He always watched sports shows, but his favorite was watching skiing competitions. He had been begging his mom to let him join a skiing section for a while. To all his requests, she had the same answer. Once you start school, then we can talk about joining sections. She sighed again. Two passes to such a resort were cool, but you still needed money for the trip. You couldn't flaunt regular sportswear at a resort like that. Unfortunately, we won't be able to go. Robert understood the situation perfectly. But why not? A child's dreams should be fulfilled. I think Hugh won't refuse to give you time off. I'll also ask him to give you a bonus, say, double your monthly salary. Olivia's eyes widened, but the company's director's eyes widened even more. He managed to respond. Of course, we'll do everything. Olivia was about to leave when Robert suddenly said, You know, Stacy did get sick after all. Nothing serious, just a minor cold. I think she'd be very happy to see you and your son. Olivia quickly turned to Hugh, who waved his hands and said, Go ahead, I'll make sure you get leave starting today. Olivia left. Robert thoughtfully mumbled. I did say I'd find a good fiancé at my company. The director raised an eyebrow in question. Did you say something, Robert? He waved his hand dismissively. I didn't say anything. The main thing is, do everything as I said. He left the office and smiled contently. That night, he went to Jesse's house, and they talked for a long time. What Robert gathered from the conversation was that Jesse seemed quietly enamored with Olivia, the woman who had saved his daughter. But today, Robert had been a bit cunning. He knew perfectly well that Jesse was at home and had no plans to go anywhere. Hal, just behave yourself, Olivia advised. Her son gave her an offended look. Mom, seriously, sorry, sweetie, I'm just a bit nervous. So, we bought a cake. What else? I don't even know. Mom, calm down. We're just visiting Stacy, that's all. Maybe we'll exchange numbers with her. And opened the door and involuntarily smiled. Before her stood a beautiful woman with very kind eyes. She timidly smiled back. Excuse me, hello, I'm Olivia, and this is Cal. If it's possible, we'd like to visit Stacy. Robert told us that she's not feeling well. The housekeeper immediately recognized them and had a fleeting thought. If only Jesse had someone like her. She quickly stepped back. Nice to meet you, please come in. She led them ahead and opened a door. You have guests. Cake and tea will be served in a few minutes. Hal looked around, almost scared. He couldn't fathom that people could live in such massive houses. Stacy saw them and jumped up from the couch. Hello, I was waiting for you. Uncle Robert secretly told me that you were coming. Jesse, adjusting his shirt with the inscription World's Best Dad, looked embarrassed. Stacy, why didn't you warn me? Why, Daddy, these guests are for me, not for you. Olivia smiled. She sat down next to Stacy, and they started chatting quietly. The girl showed them her drawings, and Cal invited her to see his pictures. I'll definitely come, as soon as I get better and I'll come. Right, Dad? Of course, my dear. Cal sighed and proudly declared. It won't be so soon. Mom and I are going skiing. Mom's boss gave us a trip. Jesse raised an eyebrow. Well, Robert beat me to it again. After the, Olivia and Stacy worked on the car, with Cal helping as best he could. In less than half an hour, the car looked as good as new. They said their goodbyes, got ready to leave and then Stacy approached Olivia, handing her the car. I don't have anyone to give this to because my mom isn't here. But you are really nice. I wish I could have a mom like you, Stacy said. Olivia was taken aback, hugged Stacy close, and for some reason, tears welled up in her eyes. Anne was already crying in the kitchen, and Jesse was aghast, not understanding why everyone was crying. What was even more baffling was that he felt like crying too. Olivia and Cal had left three days ago. Jesse knew that his daughter and the boy talked on the phone in the evenings. He also wanted to talk to them. He was worried it might come across as intrusive and had been watching him mockingly. Finally, she couldn't hold back. Stacy will have a school break starting tomorrow, 
she said. That's good, she needs the rest, Jesse replied. Rest, can you rest here? You'll go crazy from idleness, Anne said. Jesse put his newspaper aside, looked at Anne, and said, I don't understand. Did you and Robert conspire? He's been telling me for two days how mountain air is good for children. Now you, Anne sighed. I feel sorry for you. You sit there, staring into space, as if it's unclear who you're thinking about. Well, it's not, right? Jesse tried to smile. And who might that be? Listen, if you've met one like her, don't think there are no good women in the world. Olivia is wonderful, Jin Yuan, and she's gotten along with Stacy. Although, I think a woman like Olivia could get along with anyone. Jesse jumped up. What does Olivia have to do with this? She has her own life, her own family. What use am I to her? It's not like she's interested in my money either. I mean, it seems that way. And looked at him mockingly and then said, coward, before turning back to the stove. Jesse even choked. How dare she? Who was she to say that? But then he mumbled, what if she doesn't actually want to see us? Without turning around, the housekeeper replied, you won't know unless you try, will you? He stood there for another minute and then rushed to the room. Stacy, get ready. We're going skiing. The girl immediately clung to her father, shouting, I won't tell Cal anything. Let it be a surprise for them. Jesse smiled and nodded. No one had even considered the possibility that they might be heading to an entirely different resort. Mom, how much longer are we going to sit here? When are we going skiing? Cal asked. Olivia shook off her days. They had arrived at the resort, and she needed to gather her strength. She had been lost in thought the whole time, mostly about Jesse. She chastised herself for falling for a man like him. What was she thinking? Where was he and where was she, Olivia? She had never even considered the possibility of having any kind of relationship with him. All right, son, let's get dressed and go. I should warn you that I have no idea how to ski, Olivia said. Hal was excited. It's okay, mom, I'll show you. Besides, there must be some instructor there. Olivia put on a bright pink suit and looked at herself in the mirror. She would never have chosen such a color, but the saleswoman insisted it suited her. Now, looking at herself in the mirror, Olivia had to admit that the saleswoman knew what she was doing. When Olivia saw the slope, her heart started pounding. She was absolutely certain that she wouldn't go there, and she wouldn't allow her son to go either. The instructor smiled. This is the safest slope. It's almost flat. It's for those who don't know how to ski at all. I'm precisely one of those who don't know how to ski, Olivia confessed. Me too, Jesse, who was standing next to her with Stacy a bit further away, replied. They were both on skis and seemed quite cheerful. Startled by the sudden presence of Jesse, Olivia cautiously started her descent down the hill. Her speed increased, but so did her panic. Don't be afraid. Bend your knees slightly and try to feel your skis, Jesse calmly and confidently advised. Olivia followed his instructions, feeling more at ease. Now we'll practice stopping, Jesse said as he skied alongside her. Olivia, listening to his soothing voice, complied with his instructions. But even then, she ended up tumbling. It wasn't a bad fall as her speed was relatively low. She didn't hurt herself, and soon she saw a man's face above her. Hello, are you okay? Any pain? He asked. No, I'm fine, Olivia replied, smiling, and Jesse let out a sigh of relief. You know, I got really worried about you, he confessed. Olivia didn't want to get up. She wanted to lay there like this forever, as long as Jesse was there to worry about her. However, he helped her get up and ski down to retrieve a fallen ski pole. While Olivia was brushing herself off, someone else stopped nearby. Olivia, a voice said. Olivia was taken aback. What's with today? First, this morning. Standing in front of her on skis was Jennifer, who looked at Olivia with surprise. What are you doing here, Olivia? I didn't think your salary could cover a ski mask. Jennifer remarked. That's none of your business, Jennifer, Olivia replied. 
Olivia wanted to leave, but Jennifer blocked her path. You've probably heard that Jesse and I split up, but I don't regret it one bit. He turned out to be such a, such what? Olivia inquired. You mean you don't know what kind of person he is? He's a tyrant. I'm dead serious. Told him raising a hand against a woman is nothing. Now my current man is nothing like him. Olivia followed Jennifer's gaze and saw a man in a skiing outfit. He looked well over 60. Congratulations, Olivia replied sarcastically. Well, Olivia, you're never going to find a decent man, Jennifer sneered. Olivia glanced in the direction from which Jesse was approaching them. Jennifer's expression became tense. Is that Jesse? Are you two together? Jennifer inquired. Before Olivia could respond, Jennifer stormed off. Jesse looked at Olivia. Did I just imagine that? Or was that really Jennifer? You didn't imagine it. She's here with a new man, Olivia explained. Just another victim, Jesse muttered. Olivia remained silent as they continued their ascent up the hill. Cal and Stacy watched them. Finally, the little girl couldn't hold back any longer. Dad, did you ask her? At that moment, Jesse turned beach red. Olivia nearly fainted when she witnessed this. The woman shifted her gaze to Stacy, who stared at her father expectantly. No, Stacy, I didn't get a chance. Well, I knew I'd have to do it, Stacy huffed. No, that's not necessary. I'll do it myself. Jesse nervously approached Olivia and said, Olivia, we would like a woman to join our home. We would be delighted if it were you. Jesse realized he was spouting complete nonsense, but he couldn't find the right words. Stacy sighed and rode over to Olivia. Olivia, we came here to tell you that we love you and we'd like you to be dad's wife and my mom. Jesse added, yes. Olivia was in a daze. It seemed like her dreams were coming true. Cal tugged at her sleeve. Mom, don't just stand there. Say yes. Suddenly, Stacy embraced her. I told you I really wanted a mom like you. The day after the wedding, the closest friends and family headed to Robert's place. Olivia helped set the table, and Robin smiled. Finally, the woman said, You know, when he introduced us to Jennifer, my mood instantly soured because she was so wrong for them. But now I can tell you, welcome, Olivia. They will be very happy with you. And it's clear that you love Jesse. They embraced. And Robert, who was grilling barbecue with Jesse, chimed in with a smile. All right, my Robin has accepted your girl. So may you live happily ever after. Have lots of children soon. Jesse smiled and said, we'll have them and very soon. Will you be the godfather? Robert was moved by the offer. He replied, let's have a drink before I start crying. 